ladies and gentlemen, this is a regular scheduled meeting of the South County EMS. And oh my God. I don't even think they're turned on. No, I think South they're County right. EMS. And we just went through the petting process with uh, our new chief, Joshua Clark, Joshua. Tim is uh, turning over the uh, laptop with all the paperwork tonight. Tim? <laughs> Taking a minute. You're taking a minute. So I'm going to uh, turn the meeting over to uh, Chief. And unfortunately, I need to leave at 6:30 this evening. So um, it'll be a short meeting. Let's move. Here we go. Second. Second. Yeah, okay, we have a motion made seconded. Are there any is there any discussion of minutes? Hearing no discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. All right, moving on. Uh, old business. We have the budget. There's a copy in front of uh, I think it's being passed uh, on its way down. This is a copy of proposed budget. Um, take a moment to admire it. Um, I'm happy to discuss this at, at any length and detail. Uh, does, this, um, does this need to be on? Yeah, I, I don't think these are up, powered up. Are they powered up? No, no. I'll, I'll, we'll return them on. Okay. Yeah, Josh, you have to, um, I'm sorry. Just for, uh, yeah, that's the word of saying. Because what happens is the recording. Yeah, they're on. All right, there we go. Oh, perfect. Thank you. So, uh, first off, uh, I would like to thank Tim Drungo for um, his massive effort in putting this together. Uh, I will say that uh, I have this amazing luxury of stepping into this role during budget season, so I get to say over the next year that this is not my budget, uh, which is outstanding. Um, although this is not my budget, uh, I have reviewed this budget. Uh, I have made a couple minor amendments to it. Um, but all in all, We are looking to increase town assessments. Um, one thing that we could look at, and and uh, it's hard to guesstimate, but our revenue projections are very conservative and have been um, since we started this service, and since. Um, Tim has worked with Comstar to, and he reviews the budget, I mean the uh, runs every month, what is billable, what should go to collections, and what um, should be written off on a monthly basis now. I think we have a better revenue projection than we ever had before. So if we increase the revenues um, enough, we, um, and we have, uh, Lori, thank, thankfully, had followed up with Tim on the CPE fund. We, we do have more revenue than we have in the past. So that can be tweaked up. And I've added the CPE in there. Um, yes. With a conservative estimate of Brenda's request for 45000 we would most likely see like sixty or 66000 Right. Um, but her request was for a conservative estimate. Right. And so um, <coughs> if you increase the revenue, then also that decreases, and, and that's what the discussion should be. Do we want to increase the revenue um, or tweak the formulas so that the assessment isn't quite as high? It's, it certainly is going to be an increase no matter what you do, but um, I do believe there is wiggle room that uh, 
we haven't looked at for you know the first 10 years here. And, and, and based on my interactions with Tim over the last few months, um, I, I feel more confident that we could be uh, a little bit more generous with the revenue. Sure. So uh, again, I can't really speak to that. What I can speak to is that I think this is a very conservative budget uh, as it's presented, right? Uh, this kind of counts on the idea that revenue will be at the lower level of expectation and uh, certain expenses will continue at their current levels. Um, the greater uh, issue that I see with this is, I, you know, I'm able to come in with a, a somewhat blank slate and a fresh perspective and look at this uh, a bit more objectively. Uh, there are certainly lots of line items and room where we could make a difference. Uh, and those things are being explored. Uh, you know, we look at different, you know, phone bills and internet fees. And, uh, you know, there are lots of little places where we're gonna look to make changes uh, over the next year, to be sure. Those are being looked at. Uh, I think you hit the nail on the head and are absolutely correct in so far as revenue. Uh, I think that this budget and the increase maybe is best viewed as a warning sign and an indicator of things to come if we don't make efforts to improve revenue. Right. So I don't want us to be in that situation uh, where we're having a very different conversation in five or six years from now. So as far as I am concerned, um, this is a shoestring budget. This keeps us operating uh, at the level we're at right now, does not allow for much in the way of additional services. Uh, it helps a little, uh, but this budget is what it is going to take to stay where we're at right now. And I really strongly believe that the only way to get past that to lower the assessments in the future is to generate more revenue. There's one really good way to do that, and that is just quite simply doing more ambulance calls. So with that in mind, we have some potential opportunity to expand our mutual aid ALS uh, agreements with some of the surrounding communities who are actually in dire need. Despite this being something of a warning projection, uh, once again, coming in and looking at this new from an overhead view, I really believe that we're in an outstanding position. We are one of the few advanced life support services in the area that maintains 24-hour coverage. We're centrally located right on a major transportation corridor in between the three receiving facility hospitals in the area. We could not be better situated to branch out and start performing intercept work in the greater community outside of our primary service area. This has come up uh, a couple of times. We've looked at this. Uh, uh, and I, I don't mean to go off topic, but I kind of do. Um, this has come up uh, a couple of times talking about responses to Greenfield, uh, which I know is a agenda item later on down the road. But, you know, the question has been, what has this cost us? It has generated $28,000 in revenue in the first two quarters of this fiscal year. That's what it's cost us. We've made money off of it. I'm paying EMTs and paramedics to sit in the station. I would rather they be out doing calls. Our fundamental and primary purpose is to provide emergency 911 coverage to the three member towns. 
no doubt. And I think that won't change. But really, I think the way forward is growth uh, or stagnation. And I hate to see where that stagnation leads. Um, the one item uh, that I think we can work on, Josh, it's not a huge um, line item, but um, it's listed here for $7,500 uh, $7, for internet. Um, we, that EMS building is a municipal building. It's a town of Deerfield sure municipal building. So some, we just have to get it it's being work, It's being worked on. Yeah. I started the process, or Zach and Lori, and, or some people have started the process initially and he's taken over. Perfect. That Where that stands, uh, specifically that line item is, uh, that building was never added to the town's agreement. Um, so the internet service provider, doesn't recognize the building as a town building. Uh, so once, and I don't know what that process looked at, I know that uh, Casey was looking into it as well. Uh, once that can be added, then we can move to that, and that is a potential cost savings for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's very small, but it also adds up over time, so it, it would be great to get that fixed. Um, I think there, that's also an unknown variable, though. Um, you know, not knowing what that process looks like, not knowing what's entailed. I don't know the terms of that contract, uh, when or how it can be amended. So I think, you know, anything's doable. But I, I think for the time being, uh, I think this was built out to accommodate an expectation that there would be no change, right? Right, right. I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, that's something that I had brought up with Tim, and I think we, we could probably fix $7,500. In process. Yeah. Any other questions specifically uh, about the budget or any of the line items within? So, um, Chief, on, on the employee benefits, those are just best guess numbers right now? Yeah, well, to some extent, um, you know, uh, retirement is based off of last year's, um, so that won't be affected this year. Next year, it will increase because I've been hired, so I'm an additional person on the department. So for fiscal year 26, that retirement number will increase. Um, you know, uh, we budget with medical insurance, uh, assuming that anybody that we hire is going to take the most expensive policy. Um, so we put that in there. That may not be the case. Uh, there may, may be um, uh, some funds not utilized uh, with that. Life insurance is across the board. Um, once again, increased because of my hiring. Uh, workers' comp is workers' comp. So uh, some of these, you know, the health insurance itself, the Medicare, uh, to some extent, is yes, an estimate, uh, but the rest of them are fairly fixed. Right, they're based on payroll. Yeah, and I know I had originally told all of you that these were guess numbers. The numbers have been, Sarah has given us the finalized numbers. So these are the numbers that we would be 100% budgeting for. I'm, I'm looking at the numbers. I'm trying to figure out how they're derived. In the top line, on pers first of all, is that the personnel cost, the million five oh nine. Is that, that the line item says personnel cost? But so what that includes is the salaries and wages, the employee benefits, and the operating expenses. Is it's, that it's so? Almost, personnel costs at the very top should be a total figure. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out. That the million five oh nine looks like it adds up mm -hmm. all million ninety seven, one sixty two, and two fifty. That comes out to roughly the right number. But then it looks like that two fifty is added in again. And to to get to that million eight twenty nine on the other page. I don't see that shot. Okay, we've got a million five oh nine here which is supposed to include this, this, and this. Correct. And this number is all of these added together. Correct. When 
But when you get back here, it comes to 1,829,000, where is the, it looks like, it looks like it's being counted in foot. There is, there's a, I don't know, this number. Yeah. It's supposed to be a summation of all the counts. Right, right. Just, if this is a mistake number, because 115 and 189 would equal 162. Okay. So that's, that's why it's not adding up. Okay. I, okay. I want but didn't add those. I just but, thought it was yeah, those, those, something wasn't right with the numbers there. So to compare that personnel cost, instead of being 1,509,791, should be 1,259,688. It's a sum of salary and wages, 1,097,343, plus 162,345 in employee benefits. But it looks like there may be the employee benefit yeah, it, it, number, there's an error there because it looks like it's not picking up. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's that, not that, picking up the, the retirement figure. It, it's not picking up, yeah. There's, there's something that's not picking up there and it looks like it's a retirement figure. Yeah. Probably just the formulas got corrupted. It's, mm -hmm. it's been played with a thousand times. Yeah, but these numbers just, to me, weren't adding up right. Yeah. Um, I think we should also separate out from the indirect costs the OPEB because the OPEB is based on salary or it's supposed to be a percentage. Deerfield is not putting aside adequately for OPEB, but I think I believe it's four percent or or Tim, do you know um, what it is now? I don't actually remember what it is. Um, we haven't talked about it yet. Um, but that should, where it says other post-employment benefits, OPEB, is included in the indirect. That really should be separated out um, in this budget sheet. Because we are underfunding it as a I mean, we should, it's, it's Deerfield's fault. It's not anybody else's fault, because that's what, only what Deerfield wants to put, put towards OPEP, but <coughs> it is being underfunded, and it should be listed separately, I believe. Tim, I don't know you need to work with that now, but if you, yeah. if you can go back to the spreadsheet and mm -hmm. figure out what, what should be going into what, and if I can suggest, Certainly, the operating expenses should not be going to personnel costs. It should be a separate line. Well, they, they don't. They, oh, okay. They go into the total expense of the service, okay. not into personnel costs. Okay. Uh, I think what what he's suggesting is we maybe we could just read it. Yeah. This is personnel cost right here, or maybe we could put an additional pattern. Yeah, this, yeah that, that's just a delay one. Sure. But yeah, you can go back to the spreadsheet and figure out what, because it looks like the retirement number is not getting put into the employee benefit total. Right, and that correct number is 344,345 instead of the 162,345. 344, 345. But even at that, the salary and wages plus that figure still needs to come out to a million or something. Right, and part of the problem is the spreadsheet isn't completely smart, so it's probably just a matter of accent of forgetting to tabulate it at the end, because um, only some of oh. these boxes are. Okay, um, so if you, if you yeah. Yeah. straighten out the spreadsheet and get us an updated copy. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Josh, when are you and Tim scheduled to go to the different towns? March, oh, <coughs> no, that's fine. Uh, what is it? March 5th, I believe, is the first one. March 5th is Sunderland, the 18th. I'm sorry, March 4th. It's a Monday. Is Sunderland. March 18th is Deerfield. And April 4th or 5th is Waitley. I've got to check the email. Okay. So, um, sorry. The, the figure that's for FY24, um, 
it's showing 917,054 for total revenue. That's just, that's not real yet, right? So that's the, I don't think that's ever been real. And correct me, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. That is, these numbers in the revenue for the previous years are always what we've budgeted. The actual numbers for each of these years is much higher when you look back at the end of your expense and income report. Right. Um, so our estimate for this year was make 625,000. The way that I've been following that information, it should theoretically come out somewhere between 725 and 780, depending on how, like, depending on how the month's revenue goes. Um, but I don't have a good guess. <coughs> it hasn't been following the prediction that I've been expecting. It's been a little lower the last few months. And the decision to go to keep, keep six, 625,000 just? I did, took, took Renda's conservative estimate, and I took my own slightly less conservative estimate, and I averaged them together, and that got me to 625,000. Yeah, I, and so just, so like for the different fiscal years, the total revenue is real in some of those Right, because they've all been. No, none of these are real. None of them are real. No, what the real re the real revenue ends up turning into our retained earnings. So, if we end up making seven hundred fifty thousand dollars this year, one hundred twenty five thousand of that will go into our retained earnings for fiscal year twenty six and budget process. Um, but none of this that's recorded in the past budgets is real, and I have not asked Brenda or anyone why that's the case. But this is just the budgeted revenue, not the real revenue. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean, basically. On some level, it's meaningless. Yeah, because they, I can't add them all up and take an average and say, well, in the last four years, you know, we did X. Right. Um, so why is this year's nine, nine seventeen and we're back down to seven seventy five uh, seven hundred fifty? That's because we had yeah. last retainer at the top end this year. Right. Right. I, I get that. I'm just okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's actually two figures here. One of them is. If you look across the top, the 625 that they're estimating for fiscal 25 matches the 625 that we estimated for the current fiscal year. The difference in the bottom line number becomes the retained earnings. And we had more retained earnings in there because we're keeping money in there for ambulance replacement, I believe. Yeah. Well, so, and I'm not trying to speak over you, Chief, but the way that Right now, what's in there is this $80,000, which is the bare minimum, with nothing being put aside for ambulance replacement, which I think, we, as we've all talked about, it's going to be a hard year to like, put in to think about that. And Chief and I have been discussing it. We're in a, we're in a good position with the ambulances right now. Um, so if we need to sacrifice one year of budgeting for a new ambulance. And I'm not trying to speak over you. But, um, no, I agreed completely. Tim and I have had this conversation. Uh, I, I think we could, it's a risk to not put money aside. Uh, we don't want to get into a situation where we're having truck repair issues and we're not able to uh, staff our, our service area for sure. Uh, that being said, if we were ever to skip a year, this would probably be the year to do it. We have a new truck on order. Uh, we could expect to see that in roughly 18 months or so. Yeah, maybe like 14 um, now. Or we just uh, received the uh, invoice on the chassis today, I believe. Uh, so uh, that's something in process. We have uh, a couple of very good uh, trucks in the fleet right now. Uh, so that's where it stands. And in regards to that line, I mean, it's a separate agenda point, but there's also um, we had discussed at the last meeting the um, auto loader and how we should cancel that capital request. We talked with him about it, and we both kind of are on the same feeling that we don't need that capital request any longer, and it would be better to not take that money out of our retained earnings. Um, so we would still put in the, the current year capital request that we have for the stretcher that's coming out of right now, um, but next year's we would not be putting in the capital request for the um, auto loader. I'm not sure what the process is for canceling that request, but. That was the discussion that we had is we would try to cancel that request tonight, or at least form formalize that, I guess. Um, the boo would just have to take a vote and then inform the capital committee to drop it from the capital um, schedule. Because we have it built in uh, right now. I, I don't have a current packet in front of me because I, I sit on the capital committee. Um, 
So I don't know what year it was. It was probably this next fiscal year. Yeah, we had made two requests. One out of this current year, out of the money we had saved with the AFG grant, and the second one out of the next year's capital. Okay. Um, and this is the one out of next year's capital. So then you just need a letter to rescind that request. Okay. But we could make that vote tonight for the sake of budget. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that that's good. You just forward it to the capital committee, and then we just eliminate it. The, the reason behind canceling our request is the information that we had was updated and we no longer are under the impression that we need to replace that auto loader any longer. Um, so it's there's no point in replacing it this early in this bad of a budget in here if we don't have to. Perfect. And if you just send that decision to the capital committees of all three towns. All right. Carolyn, you said we, we need to take a vote on that? Yeah. Well, That's a yes. Yes. Right. yes. So, I'll make a motion to rescind the capital request for the auto loader that had been previously submitted. I second it. Is there a motion made and seconded? Yes. Any more discussion? Here. No. No. Good. Good. Is that good? Good. good. Mike, okay. Josh, you're in agreement. I'm sorry, Chief, you're in agreement with this? Yes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Fred? Um, I'm good with it. All right. All those in favor of acceptance as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Declare it unanimous. So Tim and I will <clears throat> review and revise uh, and make these corrections and send each of you uh, that paperwork uh, this week as soon as possible. <clears throat> Brenda, um, Brenda will have the percentage, the percentage of payroll for OSEP. And I just, I think it just should, where it says on the front here, other um, benefits included in the indirects. I would just put it in separately because at some point we as a town have got to address not funding it adequately and so I think it should be yeah. pulled out separately so people are aware that it's inadequate. I mean it's something we as a town have to deal with. It's not anything to do with you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other comments about the budget before we review those numbers. Just verifying that we're, we're basically saying that there's 400,000 plus that's going to be assessed in the three towns in addition to what we were assessed last year. Um, <coughs> correct. And, and I don't know, This I'm not an accountant, so I don't know if this is a normal thing to do, but it would be like I'd like to be able to see somewhere what the what the actual revenues for the previous years were. I can send it. And they should be in the budget somewhere, even if it's just a separate page that says these are the actual numbers for these previous years. I have all that information. Okay. You can send it out. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving on then. <clears throat> uh, under old business per diems. Um, yeah, so there was a discussion about more per diems, sure. So at this point, I'm still uh, conducting a look at our call utilization by hour, uh, by day of week. Uh, looking at the configuration of our deployment schedule. And uh, don't worry, guys, I'm not going to make any changes. Um, but I do want to have a much better idea of how we utilize unit hours. Um, so for the moment, I believe we are appropriately staffed. Um, per diems 
typically have their best utility uh, when there are injuries and vacations and that rare golden per diem employee who wants to regularly take shifts on a, a you know consistent basis for emergency callouts um, you know it's really not much of a solution to have a large per diem pool uh, certainly having per diem employees is not a staffing solution uh, in, in any way so they have their utility uh, i think it's important that we do but right now um, i would probably defer on hiring any additional personnel, per diem or otherwise. Okay. This does lead into the deputy chief position, which we'll talk about upcoming. Um, I will, I'm just gonna add to that, uh, it's not really a per diem issue, but uh, if that deputy chief position gets filled, uh, we would probably look to hire additional personnel, um, but not per diem. Just qualifying that. Any other uh, questions or thoughts on that? Okay. All right. Uh, moving on to leadership opportunities. Paid training. Sorry. Paid, well, training. paid training. I missed one. So, paid training did make its way into this budget request. Um, I think Tim can yep, speak the, to this more. In the line item um, under personnel costs, um, there's $15,167 um, set aside. That is a high but a conservative estimate for if we had to pay everyone um, overtime to attend training. That would not be the that would not be the case. But we should budget for the worst case scenario. Um, this income this includes bud paying every employee full time employee enough for DMs. 30 hours a year of paid training. We have to do 60 hours of training every two years, so this includes paying for 30 hours each year. We're not overpaying them, like we're not giving people 60 hours of training each year. Uh, this is the standard in most public safety departments is to pay for training. So I think it's a good place for us to start. Um, I think starting at this low end of the 30 hours and again, we budget as overtime. It's probably not all gonna be used as overtime, but that's what we budget it. And then that will allow us to assess our needs and assess how much we actually use when potentially increasing or decreasing over the next few years. Um, but it would be a very nice benefit to employees to not have to take their own time off to attend trainings, which is what most of us do right now, is either use sick or personal time, um, which is abnormal. I just want to vouch for that. Uh, this is very typical across the public safety world. Um, we have expectations. Uh, we uh, demand that uh, our employees perform certain training and maintain certifications and credentialing um, for certain things. Uh, if we're going to do that, it's pretty typical that we pay them to do it. And is it typical that it's paid at an overtime rate versus a strike time rate? Yeah, uh, because it typically does fall uh, outside of normal working hours. So the way that that works is I can give somebody time off to go do it, and then I'm backfilling their shift potentially at an overtime rate. Um, or I can, um, I can just pay them the overtime to go do it. So it's not always paid at overtime. Sometimes we can work it in. Sometimes we can find that per diem coverage. Sometimes, um, you know, there are off weeks, but for the most part, yes. The, the proposal that I included in the last meeting outlined how we would award those kinds of things, and it would be the same way we currently award shifts with a month. You know, if, if Zach wants to take a training next month, he has to submit that request before the, we would award shifts per diem, so there's the most ample opportunity for per diems to pick up that different shift. Um, obviously, like everything, there's always a chance that the per diem's not going to pick it up, as he explained, um, but it allows us to do that, and then it allows us to, out of that line, item, budget that per diem, so we're not, like, we've set aside money to pay for training, and now we're paying, like, it doesn't matter how it's being, like, it's a hard way to explain, but we're paying for it out of that training line item, it's not coming out of the per diem budgeted line. My, my recollection of how we prepared it. In the previous discussion, um, and I want to just check my memory, um, you mentioned that 
training can be problematic too on a regular shift because if you do one hour and 40 minutes of a training and it's a two hour training and then right. you get so called out, you gotta start over again, which seems like a really <coughs> ludicrous system. The best example of that, and sorry, thank you. No, please. Uh, the best example of that is the, our morbidity and mortality conferences, which we're required to attend as paramedics three a year, it's six hours of training. We have to be there till the last second. If I'm there for an hour and 58 minutes and I get called out, they're not giving me credit for that course. Um, and those courses are not only required, they're not really, they're not only required for us to be employed, they're required for us to keep our medical control. And without our medical control, we can't act as paramedics. Um, but those are the biggest culprits, but there's also a lot of them that require, um, a lot of the live stream classes require you to attend the entire thing. If I go online and I take like a CPR course or something that's at my own pace, that's fine. I can do that at my own pace. If we get a call, I can pause it. Um, the issues with those things though is almost all of them have a quiz or a test at the end that's timed. And if you miss that time deadline, you no longer get credit for the course. So it's just, you play with fire a little bit when you take um, trains at, at work. Um, you, there, are, there are trains we can do at work, and he has some excellent plans for trains for us to do at work. Um, but we need to be prepared, to, or we need to be willing to not do all our trainings at work, I guess is how I view it. So it would be unrealistic to expect your, your, you to be able to say, okay, there's a two hour training, I'm gonna give two and a half hours where this person is not going out of the building because you can't control what might force them to go out of the building. I or can't control when the phone is gonna ring and we have to go on a call for sure. Right, but if those, and again, I'm just, I wanna get my head around it too so I can understand it. If Tim tells you, I have, I wanna do my morbidity and mortality, I wanna make sure I'm there 15 minutes ahead, 15 minutes late, two and a half hours. Why can't you cover the ambulance while Tim does that if a call comes in? Well, in some circumstances, I may be able to. In other circumstances, I may not. Um, I mean, that's, it's a really hypothetical question, for sure. Right, um, but if he can give you two weeks notice, whatever, is there, and, and again, I'm asking the question. I, yeah, for I, sure. Is that something that can be it is until, put into um, the schedule? That it is until we're paying uh, for a class out of a different line item and I have multiple people attending it. I'm one person. Um, I can't cover both seats on the end No, right? I'm not asking that. So, yeah. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking, is there a way to do some of the classes that way so that there's not an overtime expense? I just want to clarify, you're asking if the department chief can go cover the ambulance for two and a half hours so that one crew member can leave. But he wouldn't even have to leave, right, if it's an online class. But but not be um, in service to the ambulance, yeah. that's what you're asking. For two and a half versus having a whole shift covered by a per diem. I'm going to say sometimes yes, sometimes no, and it's a very... I mean, it's a very academic question for sure. I think we need to pay people to attend training. But oh that yeah. Makes sense. yeah. So what, I do a follow up on this, and, and I'm not suggesting I know anything about scheduling. Um, if somebody's working an eight or a ten hour shift or whatever, and somebody else is working a similar shift, is there no way to say we're going to stagger your start time to to work around this training so that your first two and a half hours. You're, you're doing the training and somebody else is there to cover that two and a half hour period so they can go out. It still might not work all the time because you get two calls and there's nobody to cover it. We, but try, just, that. we try that currently. Um, yeah. We did it the other day when Lori and Zach were attending an M&M and me and my partner were, said, we'll take the first call because you guys are in the class. Right. It's always a possibility. But again, there's that, if they did a car accident today where at the same time there was two patients like at the same time. So right. it's just, it's hard to, it's hard to guess those ones. Right. Yeah, I, I am like, a, obviously, any system, you're not going to be 100% able to do it. I was just asking a question, and it sounds like you've been thinking about that. So For sure. Yeah. I, I think it's also a really big ask, and, you know, when we're talking about altering the schedule matrix and uh, hours of work operation to accommodate something like this, I mean, that, you know, as I mentioned, I'm still looking at that component yeah. of it, but um, the schedule exists in its form for a reason, and that's to uh, cover periods of heavy utilization, right? 
So to alter that for something like this uh, and impact people's work week, um, you know, that's a real challenge. Now, I want to add to this, uh, I think that Tim mentioned this is based on a expectation that every single person will be doing this 30 hours uh, a year at an overtime rate. That's what it's budgeted for. We don't expect that to actually be necessary, but this is kind of the what if. Uh, there are ample opportunities for in-house training that don't have those time requirements that we can come back to, and we will certainly do that. But I think it's responsible to budget for the idea that we may not be able to. Uh, I don't have any problem with that, Josh, on, on the first run through. What, what's gonna happen with the finance committees is they're gonna get you know, everybody's, what everybody's budget is, and then they'll come back to you. And so this is probably one area that could be adjusted at some point. Um, you know, a happy medium. Um, kind of thing, but I, I think, you know, Crystal's observations and, and if we have to make another, come, you know, review it after you do visit the finance committees and they get their totals at the end, I mean, there's usually a gap that needs to be covered um, and, you know, and the finance committees ask, uh, I know we will, Deerfield will, um, to review the budget, then you then we come back and we look at these things and then and then we refine them. So I think Crystal's observations are something that we could discuss on the second run through probably. You know, if you think about it, you know, what would be if this is the worst case scenario? Can we can we get back? Can we you know alter it by two or three thousand <coughs> or five thousand or something like that at that point? That's that would be one that would be highlighted, I think. We'll explore. Anything else you want to add, Tim? I don't think so. Um, we had, actually, I don't think for this budget. No, I don't think so. I think that's it. Um, Any other questions uh, about uh, paid training? Okay. Well, moving on to leadership opportunities. Uh, I'm not certain to what degree this has been discussed in the past. Um, kind of walking in the door, um, one of the things that's troubling to me is we don't have consistent 24-hour, seven-day-a-week supervisory coverage. Uh, this is a risk for our organization, and it's something that we absolutely have to address. So uh, whatever we call that supervisory position, I, you know, we can have that discussion. I, I think it's probably wise that there is, no matter the time of day or day of week, somebody in that building that is a line supervisor that can attend to basic operational supervisory functions. Uh, somebody that has that in their job title, not paid as a stipend, but part of their job description that under those training that is an actual supervisor in that capacity. Uh, once again, uh, I don't know how many of these people we would need. Uh, certainly during the week, uh, less so. Um, but the way that we currently configure our shifts are the overnight truck is a 24-hour truck. Uh, sometimes that's on a 16-hour schedule for uh, an employee. Sometimes it's on a complete 24-hour schedule. Uh, so, you know, uh, we can certainly put together a, a look at what that coverage might look like, but I'm anticipating uh, you know, at minimum a couple of people um, to cover that, if not a few more. You know, when you talk about a new chief and 
further on down this agenda, a deputy chief position and now adding supervisors on top of that uh, for an organization that has now 11 full-time people. It sounds a little weird, but that was my initial thought. That's not a top-heavy organization. Not at all, by the way that we're deployed. Uh, it's necessary that that coverage that exists. Uh, we don't want to run into an issue where uh, we have failed to train or we have failed to supervise. Uh, those are where agencies run into problems in litigation. Uh, so uh, I am certainly in favor of this. Um, I would like to actively pursue um, putting together um, uh, a schedule and kind of seeing what would it look like, how many people do we need, um, and just what job responsibilities uh, does this entail, um, and working on the creation of a job description uh, and bring it back for future discussion. Yeah, I'd like to see a plan. Yeah, for sure. <coughs> and is this, um, is this a plan that would, so, so um, say you have four positions and one of those positions goes out for injury and another person's on vacation, um, is there a way that it can be the 24 hour shift if there are two people on it, one of them is designated as the supervisor um, rather than vesting this in a particular employee? No. Uh, this, I mean, you know, I, I get the idea uh, for sure, but uh, I really do believe this should be somebody that has this built into their basic job description, uh, not that it's something that is vested upon somebody because of occasional need. Uh, that's not a supervisor. That's, uh, that's a checkbox. Um, fine, for I'm sure. Just, you know, I'm anticipating that there will be pro there will be problems with the system that has specific people tagged as the people who are the supervisors. So I was just, what would, what would you do in the absence, when that situation arises? Is we, yeah, for sure. I mean, again, we're just looking at this kind of conceptually, but, yep. you know, the idea is that uh, there needs to be somebody there uh, when I'm not there or when the uh, uh, hopefully soon to be deputy chief is not there. Um, and they need to be on premises uh, is really what, what I think this is all about. Um, so we would have to look at that for sure. Uh, I don't have an answer for that question. Um, yeah. You're thinking about it, that's good. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that, Tim? Mm, no, I think, I mean, we've been having conversations about it, and I think it's just about exploring how this is going to best benefit the service. Um, and how it's going to be structured. Right. I think it's just a matter, as Chief said, we'll come up with a proposal and come back to you. Yeah, yeah I, I see this as preventative. Um, it's a good preventative kind of forward-thinking plan. So I'm supportive of that. Anything else? I think it also provides some opportunities for folks who have been here looking to grow in their career. So I'm, I'm in favor of seeing the proposal and see Absolutely. I mean, you know, in a sense, uh, it's a way of rewarding longevity through promotion and giving people a better career path. And, you know, all of those kind of intangible opportunities, um, this, this does a lot, uh, for sure. All right, uh, we'll move on to the deputy chief position. Again, conceptually, the way that I would like to approach the deputy chief position is primarily administrative, Monday through Friday, um, not dissimilar from my own scenario. Um, the, if we are going to, this all ties together, um, so if we are going to look to expand our response area, not our primary service area, but if we're going to look to expand and do a greater amount of mutual aid work outside, oh, we're going to need the administrative support to uh, care for that system. 
there's the potential down the road that we could be sitting here talking about increasing staffing. Increasing staffing for uh, Ambulance 2 to be up additional hours if this need continues, right? Uh, we need a vehicle to satisfy that. Um, the way that I see this deputy chief position existing is a person who is primarily uh, designated to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the department. So not budget, not finance, not um, legal, not, uh, not the stuff that I do, right? But rather somebody to handle the schedule, somebody to handle inventory and supplies and um, somebody to uh, pay the bills, somebody to handle the day-to-day -day things. Um, that becomes really important as we're looking to do more calls and put more people on the road, right? So I don't think we need to hire this person today. Uh, the way that I intend to go about this, um, if we're going to fill the position, is uh, I want to do a very common public safety testing process uh, where interested people in the job test for it. Uh, this would be for all of the supervisory positions. They take a test, and if they pass the test, they're eligible to apply for the position. I don't write the test. I don't grade the test. Nobody in our department does. This is done by an outside third party uh, to ensure fairness. From there, we have an interview. That interview is with me. Uh, it's with town administration and the board as you see fit. Um, and from there, we have a separate assessment center. This is where I call some of my uh, other chief friends from around the Commonwealth, and this is something that we'll do for each other, uh, where we get together, and I now have completely disinterested third parties who work in these capacities to grade based on a metric, and then that all comes back to me, uh, at which point I can make a decision and bring it to you. So. Uh, I really want there to be transparency and fairness when it comes to especially the deputy chief position, but all of the supervisory positions. The supervisory positions I don't think need to be that robust, but I do feel there should be uh, some type of testing requirement um, and interview process to be sure. Um, so what I would like to do is move forward with um, getting that uh, testing company moving. Uh, it's not expensive. Uh, I don't have a quote, but it's not expensive. Um, the assessment center it will cost us nothing. Um, it's really just time. So I've got that. I can make that. So uh, I would look to have this position filled, hopefully um, within the next six months, I think is a, a reasonable um, time frame to put all of that together. There's also the potential that nobody within our organization is interested in a job like that. Um, I wanna add to that, that job, um, we do have to replace our current uh, um, squad. Um, this conveniently works in with my uh, employment contract, which includes a vehicle. So as we look to replace that squad, uh, what we can do is we then have me and the deputy chief, who during the day can be available to do intercept work. Uh, so once again, as we look to expand and do more volume, here's another resource. Um, and we can be compensated for that. So um, I told you it all tied together, but you know, there's, there's a lot of moving pieces and nuance to this, right? So, that's kind of the idea with the deputy chief. Um, I would like it, uh, you know, I've been having some conversation with Casey about it, uh, just how we would go about that. It's kind of an ongoing discussion, um, but there's the, also the potential that nobody within our organization, like I said, wants that position, um, or 
passes the test and is qualified for the position, at which point we do have to look outside. Well, I certainly hope that's not the case, but that's always a possibility. Anybody that we would look at um, from the outside would be subject to the same testing and interview and assessments in our process. Any thoughts on that? I think that's a wonderful process, and, and no one would be able to question it, so it's a great, great, thoughtful thing to do. Great. So I'm good with all that, too. So my question, though, because you're saying you need the deputy chief because you want to increase call volume. Right? What's, what's the plan for increasing, or, you know, you're saying fill this within six months. So are you actually thinking that you will have an increased call volume within six months? Well, that brings us to mutual aid response to other communities. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, that, again, I have no problem with any of it. I'm just, I'm kind of looking at the timing here, right? You don't want to have this deputy chief and this whole organization set up, but no new calls coming in. I think what's going to happen is um, if this goes the way I hope it does, um, and there's no guarantees, I'm certainly not making promises, um, but I am bringing a lot of hope um, that we're going to wish that we had this deputy chief position sooner. I think it's going to be the other way around. Okay. Um, you know, what I think would be more assuring for us would be um, Tim has been um, keeping track of some of the mutual calls, you know, by communities. And so um, just keeping track of that continually to keep track of that is a good We do. Uh, I have those numbers in front of me, actually. And, you know, I think what I want to do is actually increase those numbers. We go into, um, can we just kind of move to that? Uh, does that sure. make sense? Mm -hmm. So when we, we're doing a couple of things right now that um, I came in, um, kind of blew my mind. Uh, the first is seeing a Northampton ambulance pass by our station to go mutual aid to a call um, in Conway. Um, when I've got two ambulances staffed at the paramedic level sitting there doing nothing. Or one ambulance, rather, there wasn't two. And the reason was is the second truck wasn't available. But guess what, it's still sitting there. We should be doing that call. We're right next door, we're their neighbors. If that Northampton ambulance then has to come up and cover one of our calls, okay, so be it. But when we look at the numbers, uh, it's actually hard to get how many, that number, how many calls have we given away. Uh, it requires a lot of compilation of data and just sitting there and doing it. Um, I don't suspect the number is very big. I think we're talking single digits for the first two quarters of the fiscal year. Um, we've done a lot of mutual aid calls outside of our service area, and we've generated revenue on that. This has been good for us. Every time we go to Greenfield, we're making money. Every time we go up to Turner's or into Montague or into Conway, we're making money on those calls. I want to do as much of that as possible. So I can't, uh, I don't want to be premature and I don't want to name names because I haven't had these discussions with other agencies uh, before bringing it to you. Uh, but I think there is a lot of opportunity uh, for us to become the primary ALS response to some of those communities. So it's not just, okay, so-and-so couldn't go, well, let's call South County, maybe they'll do it. Now it's just, let's call South County. Uh, that's the goal. Uh, I really feel, as I've discussed in the budget, that's not only the only real way to get ahead with the budget uh, in a <coughs> meaningful way in revenue. Uh, it's also uh, the right thing to do. Uh, you know, there is a, uh, I don't know if what you would call it really, I guess it's more of a uh, ethical issue that why are we delaying that person's care when we're right here and we're not doing anything? When we talk about response to mutual aid, um, 
you know, if somebody call, if somebody does call for us, we do have an obligation under CMR 170 to respond. We cannot say no. Um, we're walking a very fine line when we call Shelburne Control and say, we're not available for intercepts. We're only available for our calls, not your calls. Um, that's a gray area we don't want to be in. Uh, so what I would really like to do with this is, yes, we're available for intercepts 100% of the time, and I would like to look to uh, gather greater call volume revenue uh, for our service by pursuing primary advanced life support mutual aid agreements. If other municipalities are interested in joining the fold, that's a conversation we can have if they want to actually invest in it. But that's not my immediate goal. Um, my immediate goal is we need to be doing calls. That's the way forward. I think if we don't grow, we're going to run into problems. Um, I think we were just concerned that no one was really looking into it. So having you and Tim work on this, and, you know, Tim had gotten initial data for us, but having you um, help us with the data and what the data means to us, I think that's really good. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very happy to be able to report that this is, you know, this is a benefit for us. So let's do more of that. Yeah, I think before we were focusing on how many calls we were doing to Greenfield. Right. We were, and, and we didn't real I don't think any of us really realized we were actually making money with all those times we were going to Greenfield. And we're making good money, as you said. It's not like our right. Our but I think we were focusing on the number, right? right. Yeah. We're doing all this, why aren't they being assessed? For sure. It's, yeah, I think it's nice to have a dollar amount yeah, tied to it. I've heard that. Like we're kind of subsidizing their care of it. Like I, I totally respect that for sure. I just disagree with it because we we have this amazing funding opportunity and it's by doing the right thing for the people around us. I mean to me this is the only positive way for them. I think we just all felt like we were doing the right thing, but we were being taken advantage of. Oh. And I don't think we are really as much being taken advantage of because we're making money. Yeah, I mean. And at the end of the day, it's a business, right? <coughs> I mean, I'm not trying to minimize what any of you do, but we obviously don't want to be operating. Well, we can't operate at a loss, so we're not right. going to operate for long. Right. right. Yeah, I, of course, get that. Um, it is a business. but. Measuring productivity in any healthcare setting uh, is super challenging, yeah. right? Um, what does that look like? What does success look like in healthcare? Is it life saved? Is it you know money made? Is it uh, whatever <coughs> performance metric your is the flavor of the month? Um, so in the end, I just go back to this: the way forward is through greater responses, and I think that we have a good opportunity to make this happen. When we look at uh, mutual aid responses to Greenfield, now I just want to be very clear, I am not pursuing uh, Greenfield right now. Um, but we're getting the scraps from these communities. That's it. And that's a positive for us. What happens if we take on a lot more? Well, we have the people for it. We have the equipment. We have the vehicles in good shape. Um, all we're lacking is the agreement. I, I, I think our concern with, um, and that was why Tim was starting to get the, you know, was collecting the data, is because our concern was that our vehicles would be out of the community and there would be a delay in response. Um, you know, it's, our average response time is pretty fabulous to the majority of our communities and I am one of the ones that is farthest away and um, I, you know, having the assurance that I'm going to see an ambulance in 15 minutes um, you're is still pretty darn amazing. And you're still almost guaranteed to see that ambulance in 15 minutes. And again, Chief, to reference what I had referenced earlier in my time as interim chief, 
the amount of each leg that we're doing has had almost no effect on our staffing. And I think this is, correct me if I'm wrong here, Bob, um, by going forward with this, you can better measure that data and assess the situation. And, and that's what I think is a reassurance to us, is that we just didn't want um, the service to our community be any less. Yeah, for sure. I, I want to throw in one thing. You mentioned response times, and I'm not looking to belabor this meeting, um, but uh, I would like each of you to kind of maybe sleep on the idea of response times not really being the performance metric it might have been made out to be to you. Certainly in priority one calls, I'm having a stroke, I'm having a heart attack, you know, somebody won't wake up and they think they need CPR. Uh, immediate life threats. Yeah, we do need to get there really darn quickly, for sure. Um, but the vast majority of our calls, looking at their uh, outcomes, if we got there in six minutes or we got there in four hours, it's not going to impact their recovery. It makes no difference for the vast majority of our calls. So we track response times because it's important to do. But I think we need to be careful with how we look at that data and what meaning we assign to it. Um, so a little off topic, um, but food for thought. Yeah, so I'm going to respond to that only because at, at, I 100% agree with what you, you're saying. One hundred, you know, the six minutes or four hours doesn't affect the outcome, but it affects the public's opinion, mm -hmm. and it affects the people that have to approve this budget. So we can we can say it doesn't affect the outcome, but it still has an impact. Yeah, for sure. And you know, the the reason I bring this up is if we do ever get to, and we are not in this position, nor do I anticipate being in this position, but if we do get to a point down the road where that becomes uh, a reality for our service, and I don't think what we're thinking of yeah. moving forward with is going to get us there, but uh, would that happen? That's actually not the PR nightmare that you might think it is. There's lots of services around the world doing just that. And you, you know, it involves education, it involves changing expectations, it involves a lot of outreach uh, and coordination with the community that, hey, you know what? We're glad you called and we're gonna come take care of you and we're gonna come take you where you need to go. Um, and we're gonna do it in a little bit, okay? And I think if you go to the finance committees for the budget, and you say, you know, and they come back to you with response times are up by four minutes. And you come back to them and say, yes, but revenues are up by $120,000. They, Correct, they, but again, they, they will get it. They, they will, but the response time still has an impact on the public opinion. Yeah, sure. If, when you're the person waiting, yep. it, it it does affect your opinion. And when you're the person waiting and you're the person to get the yeah. vote on this budget, it does have an impact. And I agree, education, all of that, you know, informing the public, educating the public is great, but there's an effort involved in that too, yep. right? You don't yep. just go, hey, you know, we're making money, yep. response times are a little longer. No, that's I, just for the finance <coughs> committee meeting. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah, I think we've gone off topic a little bit, and I apologize, that's my fault. Um, you know, response times really are not a, an issue on the table. Uh, there is no current concern with response times. We're doing great. Uh, just a food for thought thing to consider, that's all. Um, so uh, as far as mutual aid response and uh, my initiative to move forward with increasing that, uh, are there any other thoughts or concerns? that we can discuss. No, I think it's great if you yeah. can, if you can <laughs> increase the call volume without, you know. Without sacrificing without our nice. core yeah. service. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think it's absolutely the right way to go. Wonderful. When you spoke about the squad, I know we've discussed this in the past, to have a response vehicle 
that could do the intercepts. Mm -hmm. There were challenges about climate control and making sure we kept that vehicle warm in the winter, cool in the summertime in our current facilities. That's a great question. Probably. So, okay. what I'm planning to do is kind of uh, get two get two vehicles out of one. So, uh, when I was hired here, uh, part of my employment contract is that um, I get a vehicle. That's not Chief Spark's special little car. That's a department asset. Mm -hmm. Um, my plan with that is that we're going to uh, designate that as uh, an EFR vehicle. There's no need to designate it as a class five ambulance uh, whatsoever. Thus, it does not need that temperature requirement because I can just simply bring the equipment indoors overnight. Okay. And uh, we don't have to worry about that, that okay. component. So. All right, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. All right. Um, no. All right. With that, uh, we already uh, discussed and voted on the auto loader, um, so that's taken care of. Uh, does anybody have any new business? Just welcome very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I appreciate it. It's been very warm. And thank you to Tim. Yeah. Uh, so let's uh, go on record. A uh, huge thank you. Uh, to Tim Drumgold for his outstanding work as the interim chief of the department. I, um, one of the things uh, we had discussed is, is just reviewing um, the amount of time that Tim is spending. And I, I feel like um, because it's so new, we just keep the current stipend for this month, but uh, well, just put it on the agenda for next month. I think that's reasonable. So one of the things I want to mention, <clears throat> and I am all for that. Uh, Tim has been so valuable to me over uh, the past couple of weeks. <clears throat> and I would like to continue that relationship. It's uh, not only helpful, but in many cases really essential uh, as I transition. <clears throat> We do have an employee right now uh, who has an injury, um, who I am placing into a short-term administrative capacity. Um, <clears throat> so that frees up a lot of the obligation that Tim has been doing. Um, so while we take care of them, um, Tim, you know, we're working hard to cover those shifts with per diems and do all of that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think honestly, I'm going to need less use of Tim's time in that capacity. I'm fully supportive of him continuing to collect a stipend uh, when it's necessary. So I think maybe if uh, Tim continues to track his time, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yep, we'll just adjust it um, next month. Wonderful. I, I just wanted to make sure we also had a date for next month. Um, do we want it next? Um, uh, do we want it next month, or do you want it before the finance committee, or after the finance committee? Just so I can. Well, um, you you had said that you were um, going to Sunderland March in March fourth, uh, and then Deerfield. Excuse me. On the eighteenth. So. Um, what we could do is either do one in between or after. I didn't know um, what anybody wanted. It's up to the booth. So my assumption is, and just because I've never been part of this, that there's going to be more than one finance committee meeting with each town, is my understanding. Uh, they probably, I, I, I just think given, um, I mean, I don't 100% know Sunderland's situation, but I do know Deerfield. And um, Waitley usually doesn't have too many um, financial issues, but I know um, we're struggling this year. So I would imagine that there would be at least one more review of the budget. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Does it make sense for us to meet again before the next uh, FinCom meeting um, at all uh, so that we can just close any 
concerns? I, I felt like everyone was pretty supportive of the budget the way it is right now. I mean, we highlighted a couple areas that, you know, to look at and maybe gather some more information so that, assuming that there'll be another review of the budget. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I would suggest us meeting um, the week of the 18th or the week of the 25th after the Deerfield meeting. Um, because Deerfield probably is going to be the one that gives you the most um, review. Yeah, the only other thing I would add to that is you should definitely look at the revenue number regardless of what Brenda told you based on the idea that you're going to try to increase services. So, yeah, for sure. Uh, I think those are going to be estimates by far, so I'm inclined to give a range of options. Um, because, you know, that's all predictive. Um, but Brenda, Brenda will have the actual um, mm -hmm. numbers for the last few years. I would get that for the finance committee meeting. Mm -hmm. And also I would um, have Tim just look at what Comstar is producing as far as, um, you know, the, what we're collecting now. Under his um, guidance, we have, you know, put sent stuff out to collections. Right, and we track that information. And I gave you guys a chart last month, and the newest chart is not, like, we've been getting that 70-ish thousand each month, and then we went down to 50, and this last month we're only up to 60. So we're still on the lower end of what we had been doing in the first quarter. Um, right, but, I mean, that's still, that's yeah, I, I was just gonna say, the finance, those are the kind of things the finance committee would be very happy to hear, that, you know, mm -hmm. this is additional revenue that Sure. But you were talking about regular revenue. Yeah, that's the right. That's the regular right. revenue. Right. The additional revenue, the FFR payments are hit or miss at best. There was none noted in the last disposition summary, um, and there was like five thousand last one. Like we're we're going to have issues collecting that, and there's also a problem that Brenda's been dealing with with Comstar is that some of those accounts may have been written off by mistake by them. Like we're, she's been working on the back end. I don't know if you've had follow up conversations with her yet or not. Uh, there, so there was an issue where Comstar. Um, with some of those write-offs, they actually didn't write them off. Um, and so they're working to resolve that. Uh, it's an ongoing discussion. But uh, just to kind of underscore what Tim is saying, uh, FFR payments are unreliable at best. Uh, we, we see this in every agency. Yeah. It's just that this is additional revenue, and you just want to to have that information for the finance committee. We, I mean, we'll certainly have available yeah. what we've collected, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, but again, it's really challenging to try and anticipate future numbers uh, off of FFR. Yeah. No, I understand, but uh, the finance committee always feels better when they look at actual receipts and it's way over what we had estimated. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's nice to see that there's seven or eight hundred thousand dollars in receipts when you've only estimated six hundred and twenty five. Sure. I mean that's the kind of information that makes the finance committees much more receptive to what you're planning. Great. And one final thought on that. You said you're thinking about maybe one time you might not put in the seventy thousand or whatever it would be for the for the five-year incremental payment for a new truck. That's something that's not in this budget right now, right? Correct. That's correct. Um, what I'm hoping to do is actually have a discussion with you next time we meet uh, about utilization of retained earnings um, to purchase a new vehicle uh, to replace the squad. Um, and we're also investigating and soliciting quotes for a station alerting system. Um, so both of those will fall under our capital purchases, uh, to be sure. Um, just so that it's not uh, completely unknown to you, a station alerting system um, is kind of a really great idea. So the way that we receive ambulance calls right now is uh, a little antiquated. Okay, it's very antiquated. Uh, what happens is each on-duty person wears a pager and carries a portable radio. And they're very nice radios, but they're 
using them in the station right now to hear what's going on because there's no central um, source to listen to them. When we get a call, it comes over the pager. This was peak technology in the 90s. It was great. Um, the way that Shelburne Control is rolling out our upgrade right now is with digital <coughs> pagers. Once again, this would have been amazing 20 years ago. Um, it's not so amazing now. And it doesn't answer to a lot of problems that we run into with address recognition, being able to look at uh, dispatch notes and call histories and all of those things. It doesn't help us with routing. It doesn't help us see where other ambulance resources are. So these are all things that we can have on a big screen in the TV and in, uh, in the station itself that we can have on a, a cheap tablet in the front of the ambulance, maybe a really nice tablet, who knows, uh, in the front of the ambulance that gives us all of this data in real time coming from the dispatch center. That way when we get a call and we're in the station, we're not relying on a new digital pager that won't be able to receive calls inside the building, right? And instead, an alert tone goes off and some pretty lights light up overhead and you hear it through a speaker no matter where you are, in the bathroom, in the garage, in the kitchen, wherever you happen to be doing, and you can look over and you can see, I'm going there. That way you're not getting into the truck. Hey, where are we going again? <coughs> what was the address? What was the complaint? What was the, it's all right in front of you. Uh, so this is a smart investment for us uh, as we transition to a, a new digital pager system that I think is still important to maintain, but as a redundancy. Um, there's a much better way. Uh, so this is something that is useful for building infrastructure uh, that will last us a really long time. So the initial capital request, again, I don't have a figure. Uh, this is a project that Zach is working on uh, and uh, I'm very thankful for his efforts with this. Um, I, I'm certainly positive it's gonna be over $10,000. Uh, but down the road, the annual maintenance of this is very affordable. Uh, it's kind of a one and done type thing and then there's some service fees annually that are minimal at best. So I think it's a smart investment. I think it's something worth pursuing to help us better get to calls, especially if we're hoping to do more, right? Um, and then the vehicle we've talked about a few times. So uh, the vehicle, just where I'm going with that is my intention is to look for um, an electric vehicle um, to not only be a good, you know, climate steward, but also to meet uh, Tom White objectives uh, about uh, green vehicles. And I think we've reached the point with uh, public safety vehicles where there's quality there. Uh, yes, it will meet our needs. So uh, that's what I'm looking into right now. And, uh, you know, hopefully I can come back to you in a month with uh, a quote. I don't know any offhand, but um, there are lots of credits for the electric vehicles in the uh, potentially going forward because the governor's budget is um, really trying to push that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, obviously we'd be supportive of anything that was grant related. Yeah, so I know that uh, four qualified purchases for municipalities. Uh, looking to do just this, such things. Uh, the state is giving away right now up to $7,500 credit. Um, you have to buy it first. It's a rebate type incentive. Um, but that certainly helps a lot. Um, I'm all ears, uh, you know, I know that the, the police department is looking at hybrid vehicles. I know that, you know, there have been electric vehicle initiatives in town and Deerfield already. Uh, so I'm happy to work with whoever to expand on that. Okay. Just to backtrack, we were picking a day. Yeah. 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 Um, does the 19th work if that was the week we were talking about? That's President's Day, isn't it? Oh, no, uh, that's March. March. doesn't work for me. Okay. Um, uh, I'm 
going to be able to make that day. Um, I already have a previous meeting. Okay, twenty first. Twenty first is fine. Twenty first is good. Nothing more on it. Good. Good Keep evening. Up. I'm good with the twenty first. Uh, six p.m. on the twenty first of March. Application. Okay. Uh, uh, South County. Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. Great. Okay, before we wrap, I know we were thanking Tim, and Tim certainly appreciated for all the work that you've done, but also want to recognize the members of the service who have stepped up to take on additional responsibilities to help Tim out um, in the absence of uh, a permanent leader. So thank you all. I think you all know who you are for what you've done. I try to call out the names, but I'm sure I'm going to miss somebody, so I'll just do a blanket thank you to everybody for all those efforts. We certainly appreciate it, and I'm sure Tim does as well. I can't go without saying that again. I could not have done this without the extra help that I received. And I cannot thank both the people who are in the room and the people who are not in the room enough for assisting me because this was definitely a large bite to take and it helped to have some people to make that slightly smaller. Yep, I, I agree. I'm, I was just really impressed with um, the amount of effort um, to address things that we were worried about. Through, you know, the last six months have been amazing. Um, the progress we made on a lot of th issues that were hanging out there. Actually, those six months have grown to seven or eight. So yeah, I know. Well, but know. everything <coughs> was taken care of yes. right off. And anytime we had issues, it was addressed right away. Right. I mean, that's pretty amazing. I guess we'll look for the motion to adjourn. The motion we adjourn. Second. Any okay. further discussion? There being none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous at 725.